Well, I'm very happy to welcome you all to our conference. It's um, the third so-called sophistication conference. And it's our research conference, so it's not primarily for, let's say, a strictly disciplinary academic audience. It's also not primarily a public relations event. It's basically the conference where once a year we try to invite and to spend time with the scholars and also people outside of academia with whom we share interests which we want to pursue further. And by the opportunity to link this conference with teaching. So we try to, especially in the theory department, we try to link research with teaching as much as we can. And we have um, one course, <coughs> which is an optional course for students who are interested to follow the conference. The course is called Report, and to write reports on the lectures. They can choose 10 lectures of these uh, two and a half days and <coughs> tell us what they make of it, what they understand. And I'm already very curious to see what comes back from this. We also organize these conferences in a mixture of very young scholars, of students, and more established uh, uh, scholars. So there will be um, lectures by ongoing PhD students. There will be moderations by uh, ongoing PhD students. There will be lectures by much more established, also international scholars who have come here, by postdocs with whom we have been working or with whom we start to work, and of course by like-minded teachers, I guess, from several fields. <coughs> I would like to start with an anecdote, which is quite recent. I have been finishing a book I've been finishing it for two years, <laughs> but one of the discussions with a very early um, copy editor of the book involved my usage in English of the, uh, of, the, of the verb mechanical as an adverb. And I was told repeatedly that this doesn't exist. No? And it made me think, why doesn't it exist? So, for example, we use it when we would describe you know, something we do mechanically. We imply we do it without really being present in the activity. We do it without thinking. It's something that we just perform, but we are not really part of it. And that's exactly what bothered me. So my usage <laughs> of the verb mechanical had a lot to do <coughs> with the etymology of the word, where mechanical on the one hand, of course, means working with machines and with tools and devices, but it also means resourcefulness. It means ingenuity and resourcefulness. It is still preserved in the word engineer. So what kind of resourcefulness are we talking about? And is it really the case that when we work with mechanisms, that when we work with algorithms, for example, that when we work with uh, computer programs, that we work mechanically in that sense of not being present in what we are doing? And my interest, of course, is to say no, <laughs> this is not at all the case. But then it gets more complicated. How is it not the case? So my interest is to insist <laughs> that there is an adverbal usage of mechanical, which doesn't just qualify the subjective position of the person doing something mechanically, but that there is an adverbiality to the process that is ongoing mechanically. So many of the, uh, of the people I invited, I felt in their work, I'm not sure if this is a misunderstanding, but I felt that there are approaches to make this more articulate, to begin to grasp better where there is a kind of a thinking in mathematics, for example, and in mechanical and technical processes. And this is also the sense in which we are thinking about this term sophistication. No, I'm aware that it's a bit politically incorrect almost today to speak of sophistication because its first implications might be should there be a new kind of elite, no, should there be a, a more somehow inofficial qualities for distinction. And that is really not the main interest behind it. The term 
sophistication, and I was very astonished when I learned about this. This term has a synonym, and it comes from what is um, called adultery. <laughs> so it's fremdgehen. <laughs> but what it implies is it's processes which have somehow been adjoined to things that were not genuinely part of what factors in these processes. So a sophisticated process is a process which has been refined, which has been, I would say, copiously formulated, doped or endowed with things which are not strictly speaking necessary for the function of it. And in that sense, many, almost all of our also very mechanical or technical artifacts with which we live daily, no? from a coffee machine to an iPhone to a toothbrush, are sophisticated, but we don't know how to talk about it. <laughs> yeah? So one of the things that has always bothered me when I was working in media theory on my PhD is that we are so inarticulate to talk about techniques, technology, and technological artifacts. Basically, we have just a register of functionality to refer to it, but there is a big difference that relates to the sophistication of a device, let's say. No? So not just how expensive or how fancy is it made, but it makes a difference. A telephone is not the same like a mobile phone, even so the function, of course, is the same. Or likewise, a hydropower plant today in its function is not that different from a water mill, yeah? but it's completely different. So there is somehow, an in I call it an intellectual force or energy involved that has to do with abstraction, something like a materiality of abstraction. And this is difficult to grasp. And the interest that we have and that we relate to sophistics and sophistication has to do with learning to think of coding as <coughs> somehow playing a crucial role in the organization of this verticality, of this abstraction. So when we are talking about sophistication, there is, of course, a socio-political comment in that too. And that is that we can think of all these transformations that are underway and that we relate to digitization as a kind of a new sophistics. And sophistics, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense. Yeah? I don't mean this in a sense that would accuse people to be unhonest or to seek manipulation. Of course, it is all of that too. But what the sophistics stands for is the creation of a democratic uh, uh, society. It is the creation of a rearticulation of the social institutions. <coughs> and in many ways, we are drastically experienced this in all of our um, fields, let's say, for example, university. It is wonderful, really wonderful. I just learned today 42% of a generation in Austria are undergoing uh, higher education. So they are undergoing university studies. 42%. Switzerland, I think it's 18. And some 20, 30 years ago, it was a small fraction of a population. So this is wonderful, but it also changes what the university is. So we are, in as, be as people involved in education, in very exciting times, where it's about rethinking the role of education. So it's, yeah, it's a time where we can really change things. Yeah? So we, where, we can, where it's not just about, in an established way, professionally administrating knowledge and the transmission of knowledge, <coughs> but we have to reinvent what that means as well, because of course, the computer and the digitization of processes take a lot of the former responsibility away and make things automatic or mechanical or self-organized. So what does that imply and how can we find not a critical but a sophisticated way to relate to this? And this is also why we chose for this year's uh, topic copia and copiousness. It's another awkwardness that I, <laughs> in my entire studies in media theory, never ever encountered once. No? A copy was very clear is a duplicate of an original. But copia and copiousness are terms in ancient rhetorics where copia in Latin literally means the plenty. 
Yeah, so the plenty, and the plenty is an interesting thing because it means more than enough. It means more than necessary. <coughs> and copiousness was a practice that is described as writing in plenty. Yeah? And then we can say, of course, okay, it means the boundless reproduction of things and the masses of objects and so on. But there is a very different um, sense to that, which has to do with a different relation to mimesis. Because if we say that something which is given in plenty needs to be articulated, we don't properly have a rationality or a common ground for it. So we cannot really duplicate it. Or every duplication is an articulation of it. So you could say it's biased, or you could say it's just an extraction. But it's a different way to think and to reconnect with the entire legacy of thinking about the statues of pictures, of images, of imagination, and of course of articulation. So it is in this sense of copiousness and copia in relation to a kind of resourcefulness that comes from and lives within automatic, mechanic, technical processes. That means it happens in a kind of an objectivity, which is not just the other to an individual subject. Yeah? So it's a kind of a, yeah, with Descartes, perhaps we could say a common sense <laughs> that is not yet articulated. But it's common, it's genuinely common. It's not subjective and it's not a thing that could already be grasped. And then I try to think more about transcription. No? Transcription is usually related to the phonetic alphabet, this international, um, this international set of characters with which it is possible to transcribe speech to writing. And it's possible to transcribe what somebody says in a language of which I have no clue. <laughs> I don't understand what is being said, but I can transcribe it into writing such that somebody who understands the language will be able to read what this person whom I am transcribing has been saying. And this is quite amazing that this works. Yeah, so there is a kind of a, a trans, yeah, I mean, we are more used to call it translation from speech to, uh, to, from speech to writing. But I think that's a misunderstanding because what makes translation peculiar is that the person who translates it needs to make claim on the content of the thing which is being translated. Whereas in transcription, this relation to the content is precisely completely unimportant. So it's a different thing whether we speak of transcription as a kind of a writing in the plenty or of translation. But then still, no, when we picture, when we so for example, I have one of the first books I did involved a lot of interviews. <laughs> so I was sitting for days listening to the talks and transcribing what they were saying. And it's not really a process in which I felt I'm very much present. Yeah? So, so, so this understanding of a mechanical process which happens kind of very bodily, not really thoughtfully, this is certainly true when we keep it within language. But when we think, again the example with the water mill, hydro plant, or a telephone and a mobile phone, objects that are being described technically. Every device, every machine is, an, is a description of something natural in mathematical terms. And there is a huge variety of those descriptions. They all, if you want, describe the same thing when we think in terms of functions. But they certainly don't give equivalent descriptions of those things. So what is it that makes these, um, these different capacities that we capture through coding, physical processes, representing the same, but not equivalently? And my suggestion is to think of these processes in terms of transcription as well. And the language then is the language of code, no? of coding. So of making, let's say, a description of a physical process in terms of arithmetics, transcribing it into 
a description in terms of topology or transcribing it into a description in terms of a larger system of differential equations or whatever differences we have. So we describe the same things. The language is always mathematics, but the way that we render it is not equivalent. No? So again, then this is at the very core of a proposal to begin to think of coding as a literacy. No? Coding not as logics, not as grammar, not as syntax, but as a literacy, because within a literacy, it's an unvalued space. So in when we are literate in language or literate in something, we can be articulate in lying just as well as in making promises, just as well as in stating facts, just as well as in being poetic with regard to something. So to speak of a literacy addresses a kind of a ein Können in German, a kind of a capability that is separate from a moralization of it. And to engage with such an understanding with regard to our uh, technical skills, to our capa capacities, this I think is at least promising, yeah? to find a little bit a way out of very strong polar positions that have established themselves in different philosophical um, camps, we have almost to say, so epistemological positions, the analytical school, versus whatever that should be, continental philosophy, or a philosophy of science, or in terms of a, of a universal sociology, or one in terms of mathematics. So all of these are differentiations that don't need to be resolved if we say there is something at work in it which we can address as literacy. Yeah? And literacy then also means um, a formal, a precise, a technical, an expert-based capturing of something doesn't make it legitimate. It's not enough. So the question is no longer primarily that of how can we legitimate knowledge, but it becomes much more a real question of what does it mean for our implications no? with regards to the digitization of processes, for example. So the legitimization will create the reality of the future. And we don't have examples of what it means. So that is a little bit the mindset behind setting up a conference dedicated to sophistication. Ah, and there is one more. I have a list of concepts here that I wanted to pick up. There is one more. I call it a cornucopian instrument. So a cornucopian instrument has a lot to do with copia, with copiousness, and with transcription. So what I mean with a cornucopian instrument is one which is not fulfilling its purpose in reaching a, a, a function, in realizing a function. But it is like the surfer and his board. That's a cornucopian instrument. Or the violinist who has the violin and the bow. They're not a system. These components are not properly a system because the way they can be handled allows space which is yeah, very varied, very deep, indeterminate. And the interesting thing with really thinking about transcription is that I found a picture which is less metaphoric for how to think of this. And it has to do with, no, it's um, on the one hand it's amazing <laughs> to say, okay, we can, we, can, we can capture speech without understanding anything and transmitting it such that other people can understand it. So this is impressive. And we can do that in a, voc yeah, a vocabulary which is truly, not a vocabulary, an alphabet, which is truly international. So it applies to Chinese just as much as to any other language. So this is amazing, but how does it work? How, how is that even possible? And if I understand this correctly, <laughs> what made it possible is um, to relate the articulation of speech to a total space of possible articulations that is derived from our vocal cords. Yeah? So it's, a, it's in a way a coding <laughs> of what happens to our larynx, to, to I don't remember, the, there's a whole bunch of very beautiful words. It's like in biology, so very strange words that uh, you never hear, but they're very, they're very um, 
well, I like them a lot, but I forgot many of them. No, but this is something that we share. So not only humans, so there's also, so when a cat meows, there's similarity to it. So it's not an either or, it's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a varied, it's a varied kind of systematicity. So to quote how sound is actually produced from the organ of speech, this is something generic. This is something that is shared. But the code establishes the norm with regard to which this alphabet of capturing manages to capture speech. Of course, it reduces speech. Yeah? Of course, it does away with the, with the poetic aspects, with the affects, the dimension of affect in speaking, so the, the, the presence of a person who speaks. But to include many of these aspects, this is exactly what rhetorics has developed a super rich vocabulary of concepts to reintroduce it into writing. Yeah. So we have a kind of an instrument <laughs> with regard to which we come up with a code with which we can transcribe things that can leave whatever it means untouched. And yet it begins to make whatever it is that is being articulated or shared, like music, for example, or sports, um, um, intersubjectively accessible. What an ugly <laughs> formulation, yeah? But this is probably what we would call it. So a cornucopian instrument is the instrument with which we can articulate in the plenty. So there is no rational ground or reason apart from the mediation via such an instrument. And because of that, it can be played or it can be um, interiorized. So we need to really interiorize it. No? Literacy is not something that you can acquire from studying every evening a couple of hours. So we uh, mostly don't remember how it is when we start school, but it's painful. <laughs> yeah? And it looks like we can never do something with it. And it spends, so, so much time needs to be spent for it and it seems purposeless. No? And many, many societies in which literacy is not yet really established for everyone, this is precisely what it means. So I remember, um, yeah, in, so this is not long ago. No? So in my generation, it was uh, the generation of my, of my uh, grandparents where it was not self-evident that they could go to school, mainly my grandmother, so because they had to take care of, um, of the animals. They had to take care of the vegetation and so on. And it's a kind of a, it's an asocial gesture to acquire literacy because it means you step out of the immediately urgent processes and you reserve time for something that hardly anybody immediately sees the purpose of no? or the benefit of. So literacy is a serious thing. It has a lot to do with ethics. And I think it's important. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I think this is already going a bit too long. So I'm very happy to introduce Ludger Hovestadt now, with whom I am co-organizing these conferences. Ludger is uh, the person with whom I was introduced to architecture. I was working at his chair for nine years, and we started to do theory on um, information technology in architecture. He is the founder of several companies in that field in architecture, and a professor at ETH since almost 20 years now, huh? yeah. And I'm very happy you are here, very happy that a lot of people from CAD are here as well. And you can present yourself. Okay, warm welcome from me as well. Uh, as an introduction, I want to, I expected this uh, huge body <laughs> of, of thoughts. I, um, I, I can give you an, <coughs> an, a complimentary 
uh, uh, thought and perspective uh, to the, the, the same body. You know we're working for, for about 10 years in developing these things now. Our groups are uh, c uh, collaborating uh, intensively and uh, I give you the other perspective. When I want to make a few episodes of uh, what I think. So we are architects and uh, I'm by education architect. I made PhD in artificial intelligence and uh, everybody says it's a crazy, yeah, as an architect you don't do that. <laughs> There's a lot of prejudices and uh, everybody says ah, that's ugly. So the problem is, so I don't really like <laughs> what's going on with computer. F I'm fascinated with it, but it's complicated. So and I don't think that uh, computing is a solution for anything. You can't play problem solutions with computers. And computers are no s solution for anything. I think if you put it to one sentence, computers are a threat, or the threat. They're global and they are a threat. So the, the, my talk on Saturday will be in depth on these things. The key problem what we face is that everything got super simple. So, <laughs> so it, it's, everything gets easy. And by that, cultures flooding away. Architecture, whatever we take, whatever uh, consistency we have, we are established flooding away. Because everything gets connected, and simple. So the idea that <coughs> uh, with your mobile, this is a, that's a crisis of, of, our, of our chair and our research is that everybody, especially with the mobile phones, they think with the upcoming of, of these uh, connected things, with any object here, everybody thinks he understands computing because he can do something. It was not the case with PCs. It is a case with, uh, with computing. From then on, we had to go, go out of research and making applications. I can tell you that. The problem is they think they understand because they push some buttons. And the, the challenging thing is that the, it's part of the rhetorics of this computing that the computing, computers understand their users. We don't understand them. They keep us stupid and just understand what I like and what I'm about to do and making this easy and making me convinced that I know what's going on. Just not to learn about these things. So this came with, uh, with the internet, with the smartphones, with ubiquitous computing and so on. <coughs> so or, for example, just 10 years ago, five years ago, Ten years ago, it was a big act to make a video, video recording, uh, uh, cutting, make a proper video, and so on. Today, it's for free, and kids are doing it, and they publish it, and so on. And this is not just videos, it's everywhere. It is in architecture, in architectural design, it's in engineering, it's in medicine, it's everywhere. And that's the threat in all cultures, in all aspects, in all domains, and so on. So it's a threat. So you can't do and improve this problem or address this problematicity by doing better. Because computers always say, thank you. Now I know. So you have to make a step out. So and if we follow now, it's, it's about 20 years of uh, research, about 20 years at, uh, at ETH. In the first 10 years, we try to understand what's going on. In architecture and computing, it's very few research. It's frustrating. You have to go to other fields. <laughs> There's a kind of motorway. You're on an on a acre with a, with a tractor uh, in architectural design. <laughs> so it's very frustrating to see these uh, fast cars uh, passing by. <laughs> and you have maximum speed, 20 to 25, yeah? 22. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so, so therefore, trying to understand what's going on and uh, implementing it uh, in architectural applications. 
So and we got r relatively good with that. So and after 10 years, first, of course, the mobiles came, I told you. <laughs> and people thought, I can do it. They can't, but they think. And the second thing is, <coughs> it kept really boring. So I in principle, we understood how it worked in practice. You, you can do whatever you like. The problem is just sell it. And it got kind of boring. So then we made this uh, step back, and this had been the last 10 years, and we started with about thinking, what the hell is going on here? Now I think we are in a status that uh, we have very precise talks, very precise uh, uh, um, uh, reference in, in philosophy, in literature, in mathematics, in principal computer science, in, in architectural theory, in architecture, and so on. It's quite stable now. So we published a, a series of books about it. We have these conferences. We have the precursor of these co conferences, and it's getting solid. So I'm quite confident that uh, it's, it's, it's stable and we have something to say. What is very unique, it's not to just to, to, to give you understanding how we are able to work the, the Unique position at ETH is that I, uh, we can run a an, an, an lab of about 16 researchers without asking for funding. So we can do with a group, and we did it now for 20 years. So we don't ask for funding. That's very important. <laughs> so, and therefore, we, we can do quite solid work, and it's always Therefore, we don't sell our stuff. So it's, it's, uh, it's if things are done, we, we describe it, and we, in principle, we don't sell it. So because we want to concentrate on next steps. So but now understanding the principle of mathematics, the principle of uh, computer science, now we think that we understand the principle of what big data, what artificial intelligence, the buzzwords today are, in my understanding, it's a kind of, yeah, like, it's, it's super simple, <laughs> super elegant, and it's like the differential calculus of, uh, of Descartes, just making whatever you did before, but a, a dot on top of it. That's, and I want to give, give you uh, an, an idea of how this might work. But it's very complex, very complicated to get it, but if you have it, it's elegant, it's beautiful, and it's all the same. That's a part of this, uh, of this threatening thing. It's all the same, whatever you do. So to give you an idea of how this, this might work, and we still don't succeed in, uh, this is 2003. So this is the Olympic Stadium in Beijing. This is, I give you an example of of what it means or can how, how articulations in architecture can be. So what we currently see with all these machines is these robots and so on. People make things faster. So because it got so, so easy and so cheap, you have more robots. You have just double the robots than last year, and then you have quadruple the robots. And <laughs> it's, it's it's just and it's getting instead of. So we started, it was super complicated to get anything running, super expensive, super dangerous. Now you make it like this, so there's a tutorial on YouTube on to do a KUKA. So, so therefore everybody's doing KUKAs. It's like video. <laughs> so and they do things faster than, or in more details and more colors than they did before. And I never believed in that. I think it's only interesting to use computers if you can do something in architecture especially, with, with our background, which couldn't have done without computers. Not only resolution or speed or, or optimization or whatever. So that's very complicated to find this point. And, and an iconic thing is, is this stadium. You see that? That's the, <coughs> it's the Photoshop in a certain pattern. They won the competition. It looks nice. If you make a construction out of these things on the back side, it's of horrible disorder. 
<laughs> just not working. So and then the engineers, Arup and Manchester, they run around in, the, in, a, in a model for three months trying to fix it. So they run to the back, calibrated it, too small, too big, too, too narrow angles and so on. So if you fix it on the back side, front side, bam. So, and they run around for three months. So, now if you take computing, in this case, super simple algorithm, genetic, uh, genetic algorithm, you see it here. The principal problem is that you have a certain shape and geometry. You have a kind of um, 100 cuts and uh, you have errors. They are at too big, too small, too narrow, whatever. Doesn't matter. That's important. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so you simply have to say, I don't like it or I like it. No reason. So and then 100, for example, cuts. You have x, y, and z. Rotation x, y, and z. This is six parameters per plane one by 100 and 600 parameters. And the problem is that they have a field of 600 uh, uh, parameters and they're all interdependent. And it's like in a lottery to find an error-free solution. So, you so what we do, very simple algorithm, five lines. And it took us <laughs> three days to do that. <laughs> so make a random one, horrible solution. Give it three kits, copies, mutation of um, maybe 10 parameters, a little, randomly, mutations, calculates the quality of the results, takes the best kit, three, three mutated grand kits, and on, do it for 3,000 generations, 5,000, doesn't matter, 20,000 generations. What is this? And you see the generations here. With today's computer on my laptop, this takes 20 minutes. And here you are. It takes three hours, 20 minutes, I don't know. And the interesting thing is you can say whatever you like, <laughs> what you don't like. You can say that. There's no reason. There is a solution, but no reason for it. And you can't reproduce it. But there's a solution which means there's an, there's an artifact which is <laughs> not an, an artificial one and it's not a natural one. It's an alien. And it's an alien of 100 lines. 100 lines you can't draw. So if you have it, you can draw it. <laughs> but if you start on a blank sheet of paper, you can't get it. But still, it's there. And that's beautiful. And if you look for our, uh, our in architecture, form follows function, or form and structure, this thing has a form, <laughs> and it has no relation to structure. And the structure has no relation to form. This is what computers are able to do. So, and if you then go, and this is what we did, so then, no, it's getting faster. So, <laughs> because then you say, always oh, this calculability, and so, and so all these, these crazy things, what can computer, what can artificial intelligence do, what not, and so on. So here, for example, it's the same story, exactly the same story. You have Thales, the ground, one, one, and then you have uh, the diagonal from the, from the sun. And this is neither even, even nor odd, and it's not a number. It's beyond calculability. And it's circled out. It's a rational thing, and it's the alien. It's the same alien like this one. And it has been the same problems. So therefore we can learn. Therefore it's a kind of archaeology in, in, in thinking what, uh, what I think is important. And it's the same here. Now go to Renaissance, it's here. So this is an object <laughs> which is not there. 
So it's coming in time. So I put an object to time. In time it's present, but it's not there. And you can't say what it is. You have to move, you have to run around. It's the, it's, it's the square root of two. This is here how to get things to space. This is the conception of space. This is the conception of time. And it's not there. Like the separate news is not there. It's not a thing. This is, yeah? And this I think is with AI, this is the matrix of, of these probabilities, spaces we have in social media. This is from Google, very early metric. And this is the axis we turn our world around today with coding and with codes. Again, very few lines of code to make this thing alive. So whatever we ask, the world turns and gets certain reflection, which is a list of uh, things we got from our planet just by turning it into a certain position. So our planet gets alive. So this again is not in time. So we start to get a geometry, not in space, not in time, in, I would say, life. And to bring that into an architectonic, I think, is what we have in a very iconic, very simple uh, example uh, experience here. And you have to, be, have to look very carefully to see <laughs> that this solution here is life. It's not from nature and it's not from, uh, from culture or technical artifact. It has no reason. <laughs> it has not or no origin. You can't reproduce it. It's a kind of a life. It's not there. That's the square root of two. So. This, I would say, <laughs> is a good uh, uh, starting point. This is my fascinosum of that. And this is what we, now after 10 years of empirical research, 10 years of uh, very interdisciplinary uh, uh, um, uh, <coughs> basic research uh, in, the th in these fields, now uh, we really try and we are happy that we can uh, do a design studio first time in ETH as a non-designer in architecture. <laughs> so we, we start now uh, uh, learning how to articulate these things uh, in an architectural artifact to make the thinking real and to establish uh, certain artifacts of our time, which I hope get alive. So this is a complementary vector. So I wish you good and interesting uh, days, and that's my introduction. Thank you. There is one uh, book especially where, so this is just one of, uh, of many examples with the stadium by Herzog Dümeron. The book is called uh, Beyond the Grid, Digital Architectonics. It was published, I think, in 2010. It's already almost 10 years old. And it's, it presents a lot of, of examples that uh, demonstrate the, the, yeah, the, these principal abstract uh, uh, ideas that Lutke was indicating now. So, first now for the next part, I would thank everybody who helps to organize this conference tonight. This has been wonderful. It's a lot of students who help us. It's our whole team from the RTTP. And I would just like to give a warm thank you. <laughs>